Romans chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the death that Jesus died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it it, in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments, righteousness, God. For sin shall not have dominion, which means control. Sin shall not have control over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves Slaves to obey, you are the, that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin... You have become slaves of righteousness. Let's pray. Father, as we were praying before the service at the the prayer service, Lord, it's not my desire that We gather here this morning for a time of enjoyment, like we would have watching a movie or a TV show or a basketball game. Yet that's what we do. We come to church because it's a place where we think we can enjoy ourselves many times we do but Lord you want so much more you want a breaking you want a breaking God a breaking a breaking of our pride, a breaking of our in, uh, independence apart from you, a breaking from our stubbornness. And Lord, you know that when that happens, enjoyment, that's the least of what we experience. The light, overwhelming praise, surrender, our hearts or lips shouting with joy, Lord, when we're, when we're broken by you, by your word. You break us to build us up and make us people who are abounding in grace and, and joy. But we ask that you would do that to us, Lord, I include myself this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. So there is an unavoidable subject in the book of Romans in chapter 6. If you miss this subject, you're not reading Romans chapter 6. The subject is sin. Sin. 
sin, disobeying God's word. In this chapter, chapter of 23 verses, the word sin mentioned 17 times. The verses that we were in, we started with this morning, starting in verse 10 through 18, it's mentioned in every single verse. Verse 10, for the death Jesus died, he died to sin. Once for all. Verse 11, likewise you also reckon yourselves dead to sin. Verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign. Verse 13, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Verse 14, for sin shall not have control over you. Verse 15, what then shall we sin? Verse 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey are that one slaves whom you obey? <laughs> that goes, the word sin is not mentioned, but slaves to obey what? Sin. Verse 17, God be thanked that though you were once slaves of sin. Verse 18, having been set free from sin. So if you're, if you don't know what the subject of this chapter is, you're not reading the chapter, sin, disobeying God's word. It's almost impossible to exaggerate the devastating effect that sin has had on the world and is having. Before we get into those verses this morning, I, I want to sort of have an introduction of what this thing is, sin, disobeying. Where did it come from anyway? Disobeying God's word. So we'll get to these verses, but... Allow me to introduce the subject of sin. It was introduced in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 2, God had given a word. Now remember what sin is. It's disobeying God's word. In Genesis chapter 2, God had given a word, verse 15, to Adam. He made Adam a garden, put him in it, told him, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. At that time, Adam passed that, that information on to Eve. And at that time, Adam and Eve had never known sin. They had never known it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it, it, in what is actually a beautiful picture of innocence and uh, the purity of man uh, in, in, in mind, body, oops, in mind, body, and spirit. Oh, thank you. I better put this battery in this uh, in this block here. So Genesis chapter two, verse twenty-five. It's a beautiful picture of the innocence and purity of man in mind, body, and spirit. Perfect innocence and beauty. It says in verse twenty-five of Adam and Eve, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. That is a stunningly beautiful picture of purity and innocence. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Up to that time, they had never known sin. But in the next chapter, chapter 3, uh, verse 7, the serpent in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 9, we're told it, uh, it was Satan, the devil, 
He tempts Eve to sin, to disobey God's word. He tells her to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and tells her that if she does, she will be like God. Be like God. Be like God. Wow. He was won over by that temptation. He ate of the fruit when, then she gave it to Adam who was with her. The judgment of God followed, which was death, physical death, the death in their relationship with God. Within one generation, they were killing each other. Such is the effect of sin. Such is the effect of sin. Within one generation of introducing it, man was killing each other. By Genesis chapter 6, just a few chapters later, it says that violence covered the face of the earth and and that the thoughts of man were only evil all the time. This is how just how rapidly and devastatingly that just sin just corrupts and affects and destroys. Again, almost impossible to exaggerate how destructive the effects of, of this sin are in just a very short period of time. That's what sin does. I don't know how many times. I've witnessed this in just the life of one person. A child or a young adult. They're filled with life. Their countenance, meaning how they look, is just, it's bright. You see their countenance and you brighten up just by looking at their brightness. There's a joy in their life which just lights them up. There's a sweetness to their life, an innocence to their life, a beauty to their life. But sin is introduced into their life. In some way, it becomes a part of their life. Disobeying some area of God's word. They decide to disobey some area of God's word. Or or many times, it's not even them disobeying God's word. It's someone in their life, a stepfather, a stepmother, a brother, a sister. They get married to a woman who... Sin is introduced into that woman's life and begins to rapidly spread or just rot. What sin does, it it rots. Death is introduced. It rots. Or a woman gets married to a man. And sin is introduced. And that sin begins to overshadow them. This person who at one point... That their countenance was just so bright, it was just filled with life. It was a, it was just a, it was as beautiful as the most beautiful orchid that you could ever find in a flower shop. Just like, wow, look at that flower! God did that. He does that with people. But sin is introduced and before long, um, either in their life or the life of someone close to them, and, and, and a darkness starts to overshadow them. And that brightness, that beauty, that joy, that purity, that innocence, lost, gone. They're a different person. I've seen this I don't know how many times. Sin taking over a family. 
just hard to exaggerate how lethal and destructive sin is. It can take over a family, break up a family, take over a community, break up a community, and then it can take over a city and nation. Uh, listen to this. I, I traveled to Haiti a few times um, a year, and uh, actually more than one of us do, uh, and we go to, we've been going to Haiti for years. Listen to the travel warning of the United States De State Department for someone interested in going to Haiti. You go and you read this uh, uh, travel warning. The first thing you read is this. Reconsider your travel to Haiti because of crime, civil unrest, and kidnapping. Protests, tire burning, road blockages are frequent and unpredictable. Violent crimes such as armed robbery is common. Incidents um, of kidnapping have occurred. Travelers are sometimes targeted, followed, and violently attacked and robbed shortly after leaving the airport. Listen to Venezuela. This is a country that I lived on and off growing up. You go into the travel warning for Venezuela, it doesn't say reconsidered your travel. It says, do not travel. Due to crime, civil unrest, poor health, infrastructure, kidnapping, arbitrary arrest, violent crime. There are shortages of food, electricity, water, medicine, and medical supplies throughout much of Venezuela. What started all that? Anyone want to shout it out? The sin. Sin. Somewhere, sometime, in the past, in both of those places, Someone laid hold of sin. It became a pattern in their life. It spread to their family, into their community, and then took the whole country captive. The Bible is a story of how God can take a man or woman, a family, a community, a nation that has been taken captive by sin and free them. and turn something which looks unspeakably terrible and, and horrible and ugly into something beautiful, something with, with, even with a nation God can do, some, a nation that, 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 that's countenance is bright. God can do it. That's the story of the Bible. The Bible is the story of how God can remove the darkness from a man or woman or a family or a community and even a nation. And he does it by destroying the power of sin. And it starts by him destroying the power of sin in the life of one man or woman. That's how it begins. How does he do that? Well, starting in Genesis chapter 12, remember sin has been introduced by then, God initiates a plan of redemption, a plan of rescue in which he raises up a nation, the nation of Israel from which he will introduce his son, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And of his son, the Bible says this in 1 John 3.8. It says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, meaning appeared, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Remember in Genesis 3, it was the devil who introduced, was the instrument of introduction. Now you see in the beginning of the book of Matthew... You don't have to turn there with me, but oh, wow, do I love the story of Jesus' temptation in the book of Matthew. It's, it's at the very, very beginning of his ministry. Actually, technically, his ministry hadn't even started. He's about 30 years old. And it's, it's, a, it's a picture 
of just the glory of what was going to happen, of Jesus destroying the works of the devil. He goes out, says he was driven by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted by the devil, Satan. And after 40 days, in a very, very vulnerable time, he had been fasting. The devil came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered them. He, rather, he answered the devil and he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then he took, uh, the devil took Jesus up to, uh, it says, the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. It says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then the devil took him to an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Verse 11 says of Matthew chapter 4, it says, then the devil left him. That was just the beginning. That's a picture of Jesus doing what ultimately would be accomplished on the cross. When Jesus Christ took the punishment for, for sin. God's a holy God. He must punish sin. The punishment being death and hell. He took it on himself. Sin was that terrible. It was so terrible and devastating that the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, according to the Bible, Isaiah 52, 14, unrecognizable because of the beating he took. Sin is so terrible. And the love of God is so great, so intense, that he had to die in that way. He destroyed the work of the devil across But the completeness of his, of this destruction, Dennis, can I have First John three eight again? The, the completeness of it, where Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, First John three eight, was the resurrection. There's just a massive stone that covered, that sealed the tomb that had been carved into a cliff where Jesus' body had been laid and a massive stone was just blown off its place by the almighty power of God and Jesus was raised from the dead. He, he was resurrected unto life. Now listen. The story. Let's talk about you now. Of God can take you, your family, your community, your city, your nation. How he can take you captive in your sin and free you. How he can remove the darkness that has shrouded your life. Has just it's, it's you, you're dark, you look dark. Your countenance is dark, not bright. It begins with you believing who Jesus is and what he did for you. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, for it is the power 
of God unto salvation. And so the very beginning of, of, of destroying the power of the devil, the power of sin in your life, begins with believing. And the Bible says that when you believe, you've been joined together with Jesus Christ. Now this is where we pick up uh, where, where we were in last week. Fifty times in the New Testament. You, if you believed in Jesus Christ, trusting yourself, your life, to who he is and, 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 and what he did for you, it says you've been joined to him. Just doing the teachings of Jesus. That doesn't make anybody a Christian. There's many people who don't even call themselves Christians who are doing the teachings of Jesus. Being a Christian means you've been joined together with him. That's what a Christian is. And 50 times, I'm just not making this up, 50 times a Christian is described as being in Christ, or basically your name is in Christ. That's your name if you're a Christian. Someone comes up to you, what's your name? My name is in Christ. People may think you're a little weird, but that's true, in Christ. That's what you are if you have believed. And once you have believed and are in Christ, you have been given the power over sin. That's what Romans chapter 6 is all about. It's explained, uh, it explains about how once you are in Christ, you're given the power over sin. So how does this happen? Let's go to the chapter now. But how does this happen? Thank you for your patience. That was not a short introduction. <laughs> so we discussed last week, it, you are joined with Jesus Christ. You are the branch. He is the vine. You are now one with him. And it says, when you become one with Jesus Christ, which happens at the very moment you believe in him that you say, wow, this is true. I've been living my life as, as just like Adam and Eve, as a God into myself. He's God. He died for me. I give my life to you. The second you do that, you're in Christ, and you have been joined with Christ. And the Bible says in verse 3, it says, it says when, you, when, you're, when you're joined with him, you've been joined into his death. Into his death. Verse 4, and then remember, this is talking, the Romans chapter 6, all about sin, but not in a bad way. It's your victory over sin. And then it repeats. The Holy Spirit, Paul, repeats in verse 4. It says, when you were joined with Christ, you were buried with him into death, verse 4. Verse 5, it says, you were united together in the likeness of his death, verse 6. You know this, that your old man was crucified with him, meaning you died with him when you asked him into your life and believed in him. You, that was a form of death. You were dying with him. And, 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 and it says that when you are joined with him, you are united with him in his death. Verse 8 mentions for the fifth time that when you are joined with Christ, it says you die with Christ. what happens join together with Jesus and you die with him at the end of verse 4 go back there read that with me walk newness of life and it explains what he means there in verse 5 it says for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now that's talking about this life. It, it, it's also true in a, in, in a future sense, but in this life, it says at the end of verse 4, you will walk in newness of life, meaning you, you're, you've joined together in his death, you've joined in his resurrection, so you walk in newness of life. And guess, that, guess what that means? That means every single area of your life 
that had been darkened by sin. Every single area of your life that had been darkened by sin throughout this chapter, it uses the term members. Members. Uh, For example, in verse 13, it says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness, but present your members to God as being alive from the dead, uh, and your members as instruments of righteousness of God. So every single member that you have, your eyes that have just been um, darkened by sin, your hands, which had themselves been, because of what you've touched, have been darkened by sin. Your, your, your feet, which had been darkened by sin in terms of what you joined, what you ran into, what you walked into, what you chose to walk into, they were darkened by sin. Your mind uh, is one of the members it's re- referring to, had just been darkened by sin, by whatever, whatever, whatever that you had, had put into it. It says that now, it says again in verse um, in verse 4 and 5, now that you've been joined together in his death, you will be now walk in the newness of life, meaning those members will start to be affected by his resurrected life. Why? Because you're joined with him. And, and, and look, it, this needs to be a part of your and my prayer language. Thank you, God, that I'm joined together with you. And I'm just, again, in Christ used 50 times in the Bible, you just be praying the word of God there. So as you're joined together in his death, you walk in newness of life and sin begins to be destroyed. And why did Jesus come? To destroy the works of the devil. So verse 10 says this, the death that he died, meaning Jesus, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. That's speaking of Jesus. You've been joined to Jesus' life. The next verse says, likewise also, reckon yourselves dead to sin. Now this was a revolution in my life. I mentioned last week, Romans chapter 6, the most influential book in the Bible for me. This verse right here was just a a revolution for me. It says, reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin. Meaning, when you are facing the temptation of sin, you're simply saying, I'm dead to that. I died. I died to that. I died with Jesus. I was buried. Another way of looking at that. So important. Because, because, listen, some of you, we all need this, but some of you, you are in full-on bondage to sin. Listen. The Bible says what you do, Romans chapter 6, verse 11, reckon yourselves to be dead or count yourselves to be dead or tell that temptation, I'm dead. Consider this verse. Dennis, can we have... One of the in Christ verses, one of the 50 in Christ verses, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's you, you believed in Jesus, he is a new creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I, I, so another way of putting what I'm saying now, wrecking yourselves dead, is simply saying to that temptation, Saying to it, speak to it. Don't speak to the devil. Don't be, don't, don't do that stuff. Speak to the temptation and, and just say, I reckon I'm dead to that. I'm a new creation. And listen, my old self has passed away. I've become, I've become new. Me giving into you right now, that's dead. That's passed away. I'm a new man. I am a new woman. Let's continue in verse 12. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. 
R-E-I-G-N, reign. What is that word associated with? Someone shout it out. A kingdom. When this word is used previously in the Bible, it's used, I think every time it's used, other than this time, it's used to describe a king. A king reigns. Christian, who is reigning on your throne right now? Can I have that one more time louder? Jesus. He is reigning on your throne right now. And it, what does it say in verse 12? Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. There's a king who reigns in your life now. You've given yourself over to the rule of that king. So why are you going to let an enemy come in and take over? Now get this. This is, this is fascinating um, right right here in the next verse it says do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin do you know that word instrument there every other time the underlying word, greek word is used it's not the word instrument it's the word weapon it's the word weapon you know translators they know more than me but but uh, sometimes I, I i don't get what they do, what they do. Because to me, this, this adds so much. Uh, there's a king in my life. His name is Jesus. <laughs> it, 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 says in, it says in verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Verse 13 says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Meaning, don't let that, the weapon of sin, sin carrying all its weapon, just come over and take over your life, your home, your castle, whatever you want to call it. Jesus reigns there. And, and, and what Paul, the Holy Spirit, is saying is keep it in place. Don't let sin come in with all its weapons and reign instead of the King, of, King Jesus of your life. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. And then it says in verse 14, and we're going to spend a little time on this, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under law, but under grace. We have a couple other translations of this verse. Sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. That's the NIV. Next one, the HCSB. For sin will not rule over you because you're not under law but under grace. Anyone know what this means? When I told you that um, this chapter has had more influence on my life than any other chapter in the Bible. And I've spent my whole Christian life trying to figure out what this verse means. Why is it that because I'm no longer under law, but under grace, why is it that sin will not rule over me? Notice it says will. Meaning if you are a Christian, over time, Sin will not be ruling over you. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under law. So wh why is this? Why would this be the case? And I tell you, I have spent so much time. Lord, what does this mean? Because I don't want sin to rule over me. I believe this is the answer. One of the reasons we go through the Old Testament at Calvary Chapel, and that's going to be in the book of Judges this Tuesday night, is you get such, you, 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 don't, you cannot fully understand the New Testament if you don't get the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, we read this. We read this in the book of Joshua. We just finished Joshua, our church. And this is Joshua speaking to the leaders of Israel at the very end of their life. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of Law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Oh my. I'm in deep trouble. 
if Jesus had not fulfilled all the law for me. these, These verses will crush you if you look at them outside of the light of the cross. Look at this one from Deuteronomy. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. Whenever I'm teaching in verses like this, I, I, I usually I make a practice of saying, aren't you grateful that Jesus observed? He confirmed and observed every single bit of the law, all of it. He confirmed all of it. Deuteronomy tw- uh, 28 says this, you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. You shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today. It's like the whole book of Deuteronomy. You're kidding me, Moses. I can't turn aside at all to, to, the, uh, to the left or to the right? Wow. That's crushing to a person who does not understand what happened on the cross. Jesus fulfilled that imperfection in order to credit that perfection to you so you could reign with him in eternity. And then he died the punishment that you deserved for the tens of millions of times you turned a little to the right or to the left or a lot to the right or the left. So back to the verse can we have one of those translations of the verse again, Dennis? Um, For sin will not rule, rule over you because you're not under law but under grace. Is it coming into it coming into focus a little bit more for you of why you don't have to sin? It's because it's all been fulfilled. That crushing burden of the law tell you that before I knew Christ, the more the law was given, the less I could stand it, and the, and, and the more oppressive it was. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 30, and it makes so much more sense once we understand how we fulfilled those Old Testament commands. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then one of the verses I love as much as any verse in the Bible, it's this. 1 John, which is connected to Matthew 11, says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. Again, the verse says, verse 14, for sin shall not have control over you, dominion over you. It will not be your master, for you are not under law, but under grace. And when you've been joined to Jesus, and that yoke, which he says is easy and light, is joined to you, and he promises, now joined to him, that he will live through you. And you no longer feel that burden of the law, that crushing burden. If you turn aside even a little to the left or the right, it says you're cursed. He became a curse for us, it says in Galatians 3. Once you understand that, once you get that, sin will not have any control over you. As we close, there's one other There's one other picture I have. So if I could just review this one more time. His commandments are not burdensome. Once the commandments and the rule of God and the word of God is not burdensome, then, you, then not sinning becomes so much easier. That's what it means to be under grace. Because you're under grace and no longer under the law, Sin is no longer your master. But let me put up the C.S. Lewis quote. Um, 
and this is going to shock you, especially if you've been in the military. The perfect man is the man who never does anything out of a sense of duty. So you read that and you go, what? And again, the reason I put up here so we can understand sin shall not have control over you for you are not under law, under grace. What in the world did I put this up for? The perfect man is the man who never does anything out of a sense of duty. Well, let me ask you this. Do you like being around people who are nice to you and do things for you, cook for you, help you out, help your kitchen out of a sense of duty? Do you like that? Do you like being around people at all because they're around you out of a sense of duty? Does anyone like that? I can't stand that. I run away from that as fast as I can. I run for that. I run from that. The man who understands grace, the woman who understands grace, has been freed from a sense of duty. Not that there's not a place for that, a safety net for that. But what we do is we replace the love of God and our love for God with a sense of duty. Jesus Christ obeyed every jot and tittle of the law, every single command, not out of duty but because of his love for the Father. When you're not under law, but under grace, you don't sin. And when you've had a, 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 a picture of the cross, and I got up here jumping and talking real loud and gyrations for, for the, I don't know how many times the last few chapters of the book of John when we're going over the cross because I want you to see the picture of the, lo- of the love of God and that is the cross. Now, you may say, well, I don't have the kind of love of God that just makes me want to serve my husband or serve my kids or serve the person at church. That's not why I do things. Uh, here, here, here's what I challenge you on. Focus on the cross. Read about the cross. Read the Bible and pray to God, open up my eyes. That's why Paul pray, prayed in Ephesians chapter 1. He said, open God, open, enlighten the eyes of their heart. That's why he prayed in Ephesians chapter 3, Lord, by the Holy Spirit in their inner man or inner woman, that they would understand how wide and long and, and, long and, and high and deep is your great salvation. Because he wanted to glorify them to glorify the Lord, but you don't glorify the Lord when you do stuff out of duty. You glorify the Lord when you do stuff out of the, uh, your motive, is the, your, your love towards God. Now, I'm not there yet, not even close, but God has brought me a long way in 30 years. It's my prayer that that work of grace would be done in your life too because the Bible says that you're not under the law anymore. You're under grace. And therefore, sin doesn't have to have any control over you. Okay, if you've been asked to pray, please come up. We're going to end. Uh, also, if the worship team could come up, and we're just going to we're going to song. And if your heart's been stirring around as stirring up. In this message, you know, there is something that is the opposite of being in Christ and that's out of Christ, and maybe that describes you. You have never been joined to Jesus Christ. If that describes you, come on up. I'll be up here. It's a, it's a prayer of faith. It's a simple prayer of faith. It's not necessarily an easy prayer because you've got to count the costs, and there are costs associated with Yeah, you're my governor. You're my king from now on, Lord. But it's a simple prayer of faith. And I believe 
one or two of you do have come to the place where you have surrendered hearts, and you can pray that. But if there's anything else on your mind as we, as we close today with this final worship song, perhaps there's an area of your life where sin reigns over you like a king. And you know your king is Jesus. Let's pray about it. The Bible says that God will exalt the humble. It's humble getting up here in front of everybody. Or any other subject that you have that you want to pray about. You can come on up. Stand. I'm going to close in prayer. Let's worship. If you'd like to come up and pray, please do. Father, in the name of Jesus, just thank you for doing this this work in our heart. We just prayed, Lord, at the beginning of the message that you would do that work. I just pray, Father, that you would continue it. We thank you, Lord, for... We thank you, we thank you Lord, that your word does not lie. We thank you for that. You have not lied to us in your word today. We thank you for that, Lord. And Just pray, Lord, that you... Grant us, give us open hearts to worship you now and to pray. In Jesus' name, amen.